Hi, this is Brad Linder with Lilliputing, and this is a thin and light ultrabook called the Acer Aspire S7. It uh, has a 13.3 inch display, 1080p, and an Intel Core i7 processor, but you can see it's a very thin machine, it's about half an inch thick, has micro HDMI because there's no room for a full size one, there is an adapter that comes with it that you can plug a full size in, uh, headset jack, power button, which is a little bit awkwardly located. Sometimes when you pick this up, you wind up waking it or putting it to sleep, especially if the lid is open already. Two USB 3.0 ports and an SD card slot, which I find a little bit difficult to open, but at least it's there. On the bottom, we've got stereo speakers and uh, some vents here for cooling. And you'll notice that there is no access panel for upgrading the storage or the um, memory. This particular model has uh, 4 gigs of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage on a solid state disk. Um, sells for about $1650. There's a $1400 model, which you can sometimes find for even less than that, uh, which has a core i5 processor and 128 gigabytes of storage instead. Um, so since it's not easy to open this up and uh, adjust things yourself, you're probably going to want to make sure that you get the model that has exactly what you're looking for off the bat. There's also an 11.6 inch screen version, which sells for a little bit less. Uh, there's a little bit of a lip here at the top, and you can see that um, the top is actually not quite as wide as the bottom. So it's sort of difficult to open, but the lip, if you sort of put your fingernail in there, you can open this guy up. Has a glass, Gorilla Glass screen and a Gorilla Glass lid on the top, and you'll notice that when you open it and turn it on, the Acer logo actually glows a little bit. Since we're looking primarily at the physical characteristics right now, let's take a uh, quick look at the keyboard. And you'll see here that we've got a smaller than usual keyboard because there's no row up here for the dedicated function keys. Instead, they're sort of merged on here. So if you want to hit F5, you hit function F5. If you want to hit F11, function F11. Um, just hitting this on its own is going to equal a uh, 0, 9, 8, 7, etc. Um, so wireless, mute, touchpad on and off and other functions like that are actually integrated into the first row of letter keys. So it uh, takes a little getting used to. Um, like any laptop, once you've used it for a little while, you'll start to know exactly where each key is that you need. And um, the spacing is pretty good. There's not a lot of flex. So if you push in hard towards the middle, um, you have to push pretty hard before you start to notice the keyboard bend. It's got an aluminum unibody case on the bottom here. And again, the, uh, the top is made of glass. Touchpad, nice and wide. You can click on the right area or the left area to sort of do a right click or a left click, but you can also do multi-touch uh, gestures like two fingers for a right click, uh, four fingers to switch between the desktop and the um, um, start screen. So um, it's not quite as responsive as some touchpads I've used, but overall it, it gets the job done. And one of the things that really makes this model special is the fact that it, in addition to the touchpad, it has a touch screen display. So you can see that uh, we've got a tablet-like display here. Uh, one of the things I really like about this particular laptop is that the way the lid works is when you lift right here, there's a lot of sort of give, makes it very easy to open. Once you get to about this spot, it's harder to push back. You can continue pushing back all the way until you're at about 180 degrees, but it's a much stiffer screen at that point, and that means that when you're tapping it, it's not going to wobble very much. A little bit, but not very much. And that comes in handy if you're holding this on your lap and trying to use it to interact with touch-based programs. So let's take a quick look at a couple of Windows 8 apps here. Let's open the weather application. And let's go to news application. So now we can see that the news is in the sidebar. We've got the desktop over here. We can switch between applications while keeping that open. So overall, the um, What I think would actually be more useful is maybe snapping weather here. So overall, you know, it, uh, it works a lot like a tablet, except it's on a laptop screen. And I find it pretty responsive. The screen looks great. Full screen applications look really good. 
But there's a caveat. So what we've got here is a 1920 by 1080 pixel display, and everything works really nicely when you're using sort of these metro style applications, which are meant for large screens. But you'll start to notice that when you're reading text on a 1080p screen, the text is pretty small. So on a tablet, you would just sort of hold it closer to your face. But if you're using a laptop on the table or on a desk, it's a little bit harder to read the, the text on some of these applications, especially if your eyesight's not perfect. And it really gets a little tricky when you start to go to desktop mode, where You can load uh, full websites, and you sort of have a lot of space here on the sides. The text looks pretty small. I use a fairly large font for Lilliputing.com, but the uh, the text really is not very large when I'm looking at it here. Another thing that's a little bit problematic is clicking on links can be difficult when you are using your finger, which is actually larger than some of the links you might be trying to hit, or icons or other text. So up here, I can close, minimize, or... Um, um, change to window mode, but you have to be very careful for what you touch, because on a screen like this, those menus aren't very large. Now that said, you can go into the Windows Make Text and Other Items Larger menu, and from here we can change. So I've already actually adjusted to medium settings, which is 125% normal size, and so some of the menus and the icons and other stuff are actually 125% the size you would expect on a 1920 by 1080 screen. They'd be a little bit smaller normally, or you can go larger to 150% or 200% or whatever you're comfortable with. Um, that works great for certain apps. So, for instance, when I launch Internet Explorer, the default zoom level you can see here, we, got a, we have a much larger view of the same websites than we do in Chrome, which is a third-party application where the default zoom level is not the same. So I can go in and manually zoom, and many apps will actually let you sort of adjust the default zoom level, but it's a little bit more work to see things comfortably without all the text, all the graphics, everything looking really tiny on a 1080p screen. So on the one hand, it's kind of a shame that we don't see more devices with high resolution screens. On the other hand, part of the reason is that Windows uh, doesn't handle it consistently and perfectly across all devices. So I love having enough screen space to have side-by-side -side windows here. I don't love having to squint, so it, uh, it takes a little bit of adjusting to, to get all of your settings so that you can see things perfectly on both. Um, or I guess you could just use the, the default apps. Uh, in terms of overall performance, uh, one of the fastest computers I've used, oh, hi, there's my reflection, you can see we've got a glossy screen here. One of the fastest computers that I've used uh, it does have a Core i7 processor, Intel HD 4000 graphics, does pretty well in benchmarks, um, transcodes video very quickly, I, can, I have no problem with multitasking. It's a little bit annoying that uh, there is not a version that's available with more than 4 gigs of RAM, but unless you're doing some high-end you know, gaming or video transcoding, in which case you might want a different computer altogether, you're probably not going to need much more than 4 gigabytes of RAM, at least not for the next couple of years. Um, so overall, pretty happy with performance. The screen's a little bit of a double-edged sword. The placement of the power button's a little bit tricky. The lip... Uh, is kind of small for opening it, so it takes a little getting used to. Um, these are not really big problems. One of the bigger problems is, uh, oh, and the keyboard is backlit and has automatic light sensing capabilities, so uh, right now it doesn't look like it's lit up, but if we sort of put it into a darker corner here, um, the lights should come on. Let me turn off the display. There we go, so the lights come on when it is darker go off when it's lighter. Well, usually they go off. There we go. Um, one thing that I have noticed on this particular laptop, though, is that the uh, vents are working overdrive a lot of the time. Uh, when the, the cooling system comes on here to help keep the computer from overheating, it sounds like a jet engine. This is something that I noticed, actually, as soon as I took this out of the box and started using it, almost instantly the uh, the jet engine fan noise came on. I thought I was listening to a white noise generator. Um, over time, that problem has diminished. I only really hear it when the CPU is really cooking, when I'm doing really CPU-intensive tasks. Um, I think it's possible that software updates have been downloaded automatically that have adjusted it, but from time to time, this can be a very noisy machine. Um, and in spite of 
all that work that's going on to try and keep the CPU from overheating and to try to keep the battery power from going, it only gets about four hours of battery life. So for a $1,650 machine, I kind of would have hoped for more, but it is uh, overall generally an impressive thin and light ultrabook.